so thank you for giving me this opportunity. First, uh, certain uh, some disclaimers about my talk. So there is not any theoretical component in this talk as such. And this talk is also more of a survey looking at recent methods that benefit multilinguality. So, you know, just some basic introduction, as all of you know, that there are many languages in the world, 7,000 major languages in the world, 122 major languages in India, and this gives rise to the divide about the availability of resources, of training data and benchmarks, which are not available for a majority of the world's languages, and therefore the benefits of the natural language technology, which has been taken for granted in developing various uh, systems and applications in English and the other rich languages, they have not reached many of the other users. And the objective of one of our interests is to see how uh, one can benefit or build systems which can work in all languages or especially the low resource languages. Now, if you look at the study of classical NLP, language has different layers, starting from sound to the word level, morphology, part of speech, syntax, and semantics. And there are various core technologies such as language modeling, part of speech tagging, parsing, semantic role labeling, and so on. And also different applications, some of which use these low level systems, but now there are many such applications which do not use the stack of the different models. So some of the applications include machine translation, information retrieval, question answering, dialogue system, information extraction, summarization, and so on. And just to give you a brief idea, as in many other domains, there has been several paradigm shifts in the work in natural language processing. So in the beginning days, there were logic-based and rule-based natural language processing, and the major emphasis shifted in the 90s to statistical natural language processing, and in the mid-2010s, along with all other domains, uh, neural networks started to form a very important component in many NLP systems. However, while this has been the case, it has also meant in all of these scenarios that to the most part, these machine learning models have not really benefited so much of low resource languages, but this is changing in recent years, and that is what I will focus my uh, talk on. Now, the reason why standard NLP techniques cannot be applied to low resource languages is because the NLP techniques either require linguistic knowledge that can be only developed by experts and some by speakers of that language, or they require a lot of labeled data, which is again expensive to generate. However, there has been a lot of work in the last uh, several years, including some very interesting work in the recent years, which involve various machine learning frameworks which enable the quick development of systems in low resource languages. For example, there has been a lot of interest in transfer learning. In transfer learning, you can transfer a task which has been developed for a domain to another domain. And you could also do it, uh, do the transfer from one language typically a resource-rich language to a resource-poor language, or from one NLP task to another NLP task. So both cross-lingual transfer, so cross-domain transfer in general has benefited natural language processing systems so that features and you know, systems developed for one task could also benefit other tasks. And especially, it is also benefiting or set to benefit hopefully cross-lingual uh, transfer between languages. There is also the paradigm of multilingual learning, where you learn models for multiple languages simultaneously, or in general, multitask learning, 
where you can learn models for multiple tasks and multiple languages. And then, the one of the holy grails of machine learning, which is unsupervised learning, or which has been more of a you know, theoretical dream, have started to yield you know, visible systems for several tasks. So unsupervised as well as semi-supervised methods have in some cases uh, given very good results in some tasks involving natural language processing. And therefore, it is easier to make these systems work across languages. So transfer learning, as you know, is applying knowledge gained in one context to a different context. In our case, it could be different languages or different tasks. So this is a schematic view of a system like this. Suppose you learn a system for English and use this model. You learn a model on English or one language and use this model either without any change or with some changes on different other languages. So cross-lingual transfer learning transfer either models or sometimes resources. So you can take label data which have been created, label data or unlabeled data, which have been created in one language and transfer it by some process to another language so that you can quickly develop label data in the target language on which you can build your models or you can learn a model in the source language and apply it directly on the target language. So both transfer of annotations and transfer of models uh, so there are methods which involve these. Specifically, we have seen uh, zero-shot learning and one-shot learning. What zero-shot learning means, training a model in one domain and assuming that it generalizes more or less out of the box in a low resource domain and maybe even without a single amount of data in the target domain. And one-shot learning, where you train a model in one domain and use only a few examples from the low resource domain to make it work. So in some of the tasks, zero-shot and one-shot learning have become a reality. Now, in contrast to transfer model, overall multilingual models are these, which jointly train a task on resource-rich and resource-poor languages, or in general, multiple languages, using a language universal representation. Now, since the beginning days of NLP, or rather, you know, machine translation is one of the holy grail tasks in NLP. And uh, when we work on classical NLP, we work with the Vokua diagram, where we are shown that there are different levels of transfer from one language, sentences in one language to sentences in another language. Direct, syntactic transfer, semantic transfer. And the top of the triangle, there was this Vokua diagram. It, there was this interlingua, which is supposed to be a language independent representation of sentences or concepts in a language. And now the models which have been built for machine translation have made, you know, for example, such interlingual language independent representations for natural language sentences a reality. So you can have, in general, a single model which can work for a large number of languages. And in many cases, it has been seen that multilingual models outperform monolingual models. Now, just to come to neural networks for NLP, as in most other tasks, neural networks have been the state of the art in many NLP problems, you know, not limited to entity relation finding, parsing, machine translation, entity linking, and so on. And what enables, what are the main enablers of this cross-lingual transfer learning are, one is shared representation. So what we mean by this, that we have seen several talks today about embeddings or representations. Now, if these representations can be made language independent, or the embeddings can at least be shared by multiple languages, that will enable one to develop models that can work across languages. So there has been a lot of work on shared representation and also having, in general, having these bilingual or multilingual resources enable one to 
transfer annotations or label data from one language to another. Even though the amount of such resources may not be much for some language pairs, that can be compensated by having more of the resources from other languages and somehow leverage this. Now, just a brief, even though many Spanish speakers have talked about this, the embedding has become one of the key enablers for NLP systems in neural, using neural networks. And as you know, that the traditional, the most popular models developed by Mikolov et al. were based on, um, based on unlabeled text. So basically, one takes advantage of monolingual sentences without any labels and trains on the language modeling task. And for that, there were two very classical models, Sibau and Skipgram, which try to infer a word from its context or the context from the word. And based on that, they learn a dense representation of the word. There have been other other you know, uh, uh, embeddings which people have worked on, for example, fast text, which looks at sub-word embedding, so that they can also handle this and other uh, methods which look at the um, character engrams at the sub-word levels can also handle out-of-vocabulary words. And out-of-vocabulary words typically have been a sore point in many NLP systems. And in many cases, the orthography of the words in the sentence, uh, you know, orthography of the characters in the word give a lot of information. And then, recently there have been a lot of uh, advances in contextual representation of words. For example, you know, um, as you know, in natural language, words may have, many words have multiple senses, and the particular sense of a word depends on the context in which it is placed. So, several contextual embeddings have been developed recently, which have a fixed embedding as well as embeddings. So, but when one uses a deep neural network, which computes different functions, which are more, uh, you know, higher with higher levels of abstraction at different layers of the network. And these, um, these higher layer functions capture features which are at higher level and capture, maybe thought of as capturing the syntactical and semantical con context of the word as it is positioned in the sentence. Along with that, that they also use subword information. So ELMO has one particular um, type of such architecture, which comprises of some uh, you know, stacked LSTMs in both directions, and which give rise to a number of features. And how these features can be combined for a particular representation for a particular task can become task specific. So you learn the features, in a task independent manner using the language modeling task. And then they can be combined in a particular way to benefit a particular task. And then there have been several alternative models, such as the OpenAI model, the ULM fit model, and the BERT model. So BERT model is a model by Google, which is a bidirectional encoder representation which have you know, certain features and, which, uh, and uh, such models have been developed which these representations are by themselves language independent, you know, by themselves task independent. However, they give you handles to various features which can be combined for a particular task. And by using this embedding, just by using this embedding in standard NLP tasks have given rise to a you know, reasonably large moderate increase in the state of the art performance of various standard NLP tasks in recent years. The next thing that I want to talk about 
is if we want to use these embeddings to benefit low resource languages, one way of doing it is to come up with a shared representation. Because if you can have shared representation where two languages or words in two languages or words in multiple languages, they can, if they can share the same vector space, such as two words will be close to, to each other in the vector space if their meanings is similar, irrespective of what language they come from. And they can benefit transfer learning, cross, you know, machine translation, cross-lingual information retrieval, et cetera, among others. And there have been various work in this, starting from simple work, starting with Mikolov and others, who worked on getting some basic linear transformations from one space to another, to more advanced work in recent years, some of which we are, I'm going to talk about. There have been, as I said, there have been methods which depend on various resources. For example, the uh, uh, availability of a small bilingual dictionary or having a sentence aligned parallel data or document aligned corpora or comparable corpora such as Wikipedia uh, data. And recently there has been a lot of uh, uh, good work on unsupervised multilingual word embedding. So I will not uh, uh, go into the details of the task, I'll just briefly mention so one of the work we did earlier on cross-lingual information retrieval, where we trained the word embedding based on Wikipedia para, in corpus in multiple languages, based on the what have small dictionaries, and by forming some clusters among these words, and used it for information retrieval task. But in the last uh, two years, there has been a lot of uh, good work on unsupervised word translation, which do not depend on either dictionary or parallel corpus, or only which are based on monolingual corpora. So one example of this work is uh, by this group, Connell, Lamplay, and others, Ranzato and others. So what they do is that they take monolingual corpora in two languages or n languages, and they independently first learn the word embedding for the words in English, and separately the word embedding for the words, let's say Italian. And then they try to learn a rotation matrix to roughly align the two domains. And so that, you know, so for, uh, firstly, they focus on the frequent words, the pick a word at random from each language, embed them, then project one of the two, and then try to rotate the embeddings to make sure the distributions match. And they use uh, some methods so that they maintain the shapes of the distribution and maintain some orthogonality criteria of the mapping using the most frequent words. And then after some iterations, they iterate this and they're able to get a very good uh, common embedding. And so they show the result on word translation. Word translation is a task where you want to <coughs> Given a, you know, you want to, given a word in one language, you want to find the translation in another language. So, and this particular result taken from their paper, it shows the P at one, precision at one, on word translation, which if you look at it is not really a very simple task. However, and they have compared the results, not only with, you know, their result is completely unsupervised, but they have compared it with standard even supervised models which rely on, as I said, small dictionary or parallel data. For example, this one is Mikolov's work on uh, bilingual embeddings, then Faruqi and Dias' work in CCA and all that. So this is the work by Atex, so this is another common work. And this particular work, these two are based on their unsupervised methods. And as you can see that in English Italian, they achieve a P at one score of 66, which is pretty impressive based on only unsupervised, yeah.
semantic information yeah. which preserves actually in the, so basically the work on this uh, bilingual word vectors the initial work was done by Mikolov and all so where they learned a simple linear transformation now when word vectors were first you know taken at so people believed that this there were some linear relations which were being uh, you know hyped and shown between the words like you know king minus queen is man minus woman so it was believed that simple linear relations exist and you don't require a very complex non-linear model and on that basis this the, the you know the most of the transformations that these people have done are based on this simple linear mapping right now i have also seen a very recent work which i didn't i'm not presenting today you know just came to archive a few weeks ago so they have done some studies on whether these global linear mappings work well and they have reported that you could, you could have these linear mappings you know you know there's a lot of complexity which i'm not going if you take two language words vocabulary of two languages there's a core vocabulary which is common there is some peripheral vocabulary which is you know some is common in one language some in the other and there are some other things which are not there because these words are you know very culture specific region specific etc and it also has been shown that they claim that in different neighborhoods this linear mapping may work somewhat piecewise linear but uh, they have shown that if you want if you do simple mappings in separate regions but overall do not have a linear mapping that does even better so i'm not really talking about it so uh, as you see that this is a very simple mapping and even with that they have good scores but definitely there is a lot of scope of work people are still working on it and there are more complex models which are coming up so now if they can use more anchor points so for so this is completely unsupervised but it is also possible you use a small dictionary of a few words use these words and anchor points so that you can start uh, you can uh, make the system faster and learn better types of mapping and by using more anchor points and lots of unlabeled data they even outperform supervised approaches and of course you know it can be improved by more sophisticated methods but even without that it is doing quite well now this is another work EMNLP 2018 by Cardi's group. So again, this is a method for learning multilingual word embedding. And their objective again is to learn a single multilingual embedding space using only monolingual word embedding, monolingual corpus to monolingual embedding using basic word to make back methods. And then they exploit the interdependencies between two languages and map the monolingual embedding into a shared multilingual embedding space by a two stage algorithm first stage they do a multilingual adversarial serial training and then they use multilingual pseudo supervised refinement and based on that again they get a dictionary of highly confident word pairs and so they initially do uh, this adversarial training so that they can you know they can um, map so they can take one pivot uh, language they can take the other language words and map it to the pivot language and they have a discriminator which tries to distinguish between the language of the words and the generator which prevents that being done and based on the thing that they, they identify uh, some pairs which they use as pseudo dictionary and then they reiterate these steps and again uh, they get very good results which they use in subsequent work now before i go to machine translate i'll talk very briefly about this so transfer has been used for developing nlp and taking models or resources from resource poor to resource rich language i'll very briefly talk about our work we did and other people have also done for dependency parsing there were two standard methods of transfer not unsupervised but with very little data so not really data so delexicalized transfer so they develop models which do not depend on the they use models which do not depend on the words in the language but on the parts of speech 
They assume you have part of speech tagger in the both the languages, and the model developed on part of speech can be transferred from one language to other. The second method is based on annotation projection, where you use a small set of parallel sentences, and based on that, uh, you take the label data from one language, map it to the label data with another language from which you develop a model. So we applied this for between um, parsers to develop between Bengali and Hindi. We used uh, chunking, and then we tried to identify the syntactic differences in the syntax of the two languages, you know, express them as distribution and did some stochastic transfer. We took multiple source languages, one target language, did some syntactic transformation, concatenated these combined, and we got fairly good results for this Hindi to Bengali system. Again, I'm not going into the details of this particular system. So what we will talk about is machine translation, which is one of the most visible and one of the holy grail of NLP. And we will see how recent results have worked on NLP between uh, low-resource low languages based on unsupervised, uh, completely unsupervised ones. Now, the standard neural machine translation, the uh, uh, neural machine translation systems started with the encoder-decoder model, and a very good model was developed starting in 2014 or 2015 by now which was based on an encoder-decoder model and attention. And based on that, they developed this neural machine translation system, and they became very competitive. And uh, very soon, um, you know, Google and others developed neural machine translation system, which in 2016 or 17, I think, replaced their other statistical machine translation system. Now, following this, there were also other improvements or mainly improvements in time on machine translation systems, starting with convolutional systems, then transformer systems, which use only attention, then universal transformers, and so on. For example, which reduced the training time, made the systems parallelizable, and did very good work on machine translation. So very briefly, I will just go through, look at the this is the convest to n convest to s model is convolutional model, which did not use the recurrent neural network, but did some positional encoding and had a basic convolutional system. And based on that, they were able to reduce the time from order n, n is the number of words in the sentence, to order n by k. And then transformers changed it to order 1. So this convest to s architectures have you know, different components. Basically, they have an encoder, which has input as the word plus position, then gated linear units, sigmoid. So we'll not go into those details. Basically, they have an encoder based on convolutional networks. They have an attention model, and they have a decoder, and they have these outputs. And they use this word vector. And then there was a transformer. Again, I will not go into the details. So transformer is a purely attention-based model, and again, this particular model, they had six layers, and each had several sub-layers. They had different uh, you know, innovations in the way they have positional encoding, they have multi-headed attention, and all those things. And then you know, they have self-attention, and then they have universal transformers, which can also is Turing uh, powerful and can do much more. And also, there have been some systems on adversarial machine translation. So anyway, so the basic thing is that machine translation models, starting from the attention, basic attention model to other innovations in time, which gave better quality translation, better time, have been, uh, uh, you know, have uh, really done a good job. And actually, when we look at machine translation systems, machine translation systems are not just for the task of machine translation. They can be used for any task which involves one input and one input sequence, one output sequence. For example, they can be used to do parsing. They can be used to do, they have been used to do image to text uh, captioning, video captioning. So many other tasks can be posed as a translation task. That is why these methods are very powerful. So now I will talk about uh, multilingual machine translation. And these two papers, uh, before we do multilingual translation, okay. So multilingual translation, 
There were two papers in 2017, one from Google's group by you know, these people, Johnson, Schuster et al., another by Kim Hyun Cho and the other people, they almost came uh, simultaneously, and their models are also very similar. So the basic idea is that they have this encoder-decoder attention model, which you could replace it by any of the other machine translation models that you have. But the basic uh, point of this was that this encoder can be made language independent. And this decoder can be, this, we have this encoder with the shared attention and the decoder, and this system can work can be used to translate between two languages. So they do not have, you know, suppose you have n languages, right? So if you want to have translator systems between any pair of these n languages, you would need to develop NC2 translator systems. And you may not have um, translation pairs for all the pairs. You may have translations involving some of the pairs. For example, you can have English, Japanese, you can have English Portuguese, but not Japanese to Portuguese. So this sort of multi multilingual machine translation systems can, since they use a shared encoder and a shared decoder, and they can be trained on uh, some of the language pairs out of these N languages, and they can be used to translate between other language pairs which have not been seen. And a similar method by the other group, again, they claim they have this uh, they have multiple encoders, they have decoders, and they have a language agnostic continuous vector space where the sentences are represented. And so these multilingual machine translation system gives rise to this phenomena of zero-shot learning. For example, you may have pairs from Korean to English and you know, English to Japanese, but not between Korean to Japanese, and they've demonstrated that this system could learn to translate between Korean and Japanese. And in fact, you could also not uh, limit yourself to only language translation. You can build in other tasks like image to text, text to image, and you can train all of them so that these inputs can be represented by a common vector, which is sort of a modality agnostic space, language agnostic space, modality agnostic space, which is somewhat like the interlingua that people have dreamt of. Now, this paper, this picture from Google shows the representation of different sentences in this, this space, right? Now, it's color-coded, like the red dots are sentences in English, the blue dots are sentences in Korean and Japanese, and in the Japanese are these brown dots or whatever. Now, if you look at these, you know, if you look at a cluster here, and then if you read the sentences which represent the points in the cluster, for example, if you take one of the sentences from this group, the English sentence says the stratosphere extends from about 10 kilometer to about 50 kilometer in altitude. The nearest neighbor sentence in Korean has similar meaning. So sentences, which have similar meaning come together on this space. So this is almost a language independent space. There have been also some specific work in recent years which specifically target multilingual sentence embedding. So this is one of the latest work, November 2018 by Artex and all. So they learn multilingual sentence embedding they have NVA aligned corpora, they use a shared encoder. So what they do is that they use parallel sentences and they use it in an encoder decoder machine translation architecture. And then when they have trained it, they remove the decoder and they said this encoder is shared between all the languages. And then when you look at a particular vector, so you take a sentence, let's say in English, you find the embedding of that sentence, and if you want to find the translation of similar sentence in Korean, you find the nearest neighbor from this sentence. So that was their initial model, which uses the cosine distance between the sentences in two different languages, and they saw that there was a lot of improvement that they could do by changing this score. 
So they consider the margin of the cosine of a given sentence pair and that of its k nearest neighbors. Based on that, they have developed the system which can now take in sentences from uh, you know, monolingual sentences and then for a particular sentence in one language, they can try to tell you if there is a parallel sentence of another language in your corpus. And that could be also used as parallel corpora, which could be fed to other NLP systems. And what they showed is that by this method, they have been able to, you know, I'm not showing the results, they have been able to get extremely good result in developing this common sentence embedding and also in developing parallel corpora. Finally, I come to the unsupervised machine translation. So as we have seen that machine translation, or as we have know that machine translation, a good quality machine translation using statistical methods or neural network methods traditionally require a large number of parallel sentences of the order of several millions, and such resources are not available for most of the languages. Now, the work, these two work were present in ICLR 2018. So they showed, you know, they are very similar with some minor differences. They showed that using monolingual data only of the two languages, you could develop a reasonably good quality uh, machine translation system. I mean, moderate quality. And then they also showed by using other innovations or using a few labeled pairs, they could better even the supervised um, translation capabilities. They used this method called back translation. This back translation, the basic methods, was introduced by Sendrich et al. in 2015. So in this work, they used a small parallel data set or none and huge monolingual corpus. So they take, uh, I'm sorry, they take uh, a sentence in English with a very basic translation system. They Let us say they translate it into French and then they use this translator to generate a large amount of sentences in French given English monolingual sentence and use it for their translation. So this was the basic method which was developed and we will see how this method or some variation of this method were used in these two papers. This is by Lampley et al. and Atexe et al. Both were in ICLR 2018 using unsupervised machine translation, which used only monolingual corpora. So we'll just briefly talk about these two work. So the firstly, we'll talk about the unsupervised neural machine translation by Atexe et al. So their basic idea is that they have a shared encoder. So they have two languages, L1 and L2, and for each of the languages, they have monolingual corpora based on which they come up with monolingual embedding of the words in L1 and the words in L2. They have a shared encoder where uh, they use, so what they do is that using one of the methods that we have described, they bring L1 and L2 embeddings into the same vector space. So they have this fixed cross-lingual embedding which they are going to use. Now, if they take a sentence in L1, they represent the words in a sentence using that fixed embedding, and they have some standard, uh, you know, let us say, LS by LSTM based, attention based machine translation system, which, you know, translation system by which they can encode this sentence. Now, they don't have, a, they don't use any parallel sentence. So, how are they going to do it? They use denoising. So what they do is that they use, you know, they try to uh, inject noise into the sentence and they want the decoder to give them back the original sentence. So they use some, they take the sentence, they take the words in the sentence, do some random swaps, so n, n words in the sentence, do n by two random swaps, and then you, they use the shared encoder and they use the L1 decoder to reconstruct the original sentence by removing the noise. And they do it for L1, for sentences from L1 and from sentences from L2, by which they can tune the 
L1 decoder, the L2 decoder, and the shared encoder. And then they use on the fly back translation. So what they do is that they, trans they take a sentence in language L1, just a few minutes, they take a sentence in language L1, and now uses this L2 decoder to translate it into L2, by which they get a noisy sentence in L2, and this noisy sentence in L2, they feed again to this encoder, and then they use the L1 decoder to uh, translate it to, into L1. And they try to now uh, minimize the loss between the sentence, original sentence, and the reconstructed sentence. So they alternate between these two phases. So there are some details about the particular architecture, uh, but uh, so basically they, they use a shared encoder and decoder learns to decompose this representation into the corresponding language. And this is some illustration that of the denoising part and the back translation part. They do denoising of L1, denoising of L2, back translation L1 to L2, back translation L2 to L1, do it in several iterations. And then they develop, based on this, they develop an unsupervised machine translation system. And they show that this unsupervised machine translation system with uh, this byte encoding, subword encodings, achieve or even without that, they achieve a fairly good Blois scores in machine translation, which is, you know, most of the languages, they are equivalent to using 100,000 100, parallel sentences for translation. Not very good but they do reasonably good. And then, when they use this unsupervised method, along with small number of parallel sentences, like 10,000 or 100,000, they get fairly good Blois scores, which is comparable to, in some of the languages, to the Blois scores achieved for a full NMT. So neural machine translation with 100,000 parallel sentence gets 10.4 Blois scores. The semi-supervised method gets 21.81, and a good GNMT has a score of 20.48. So it's very comparable. The second method, somewhat similar, a little bit different. Again, they reconstruct a sentence from its noisy version using a, the same principles as a denoising autoencoder. That is, they take X, a sentence in language L1, they take the sentence x, injects noise in it, makes it into cx by dropping some words and some permutations of the words. And then from that, they bring it to a shared latent space. They come up with a shared latent space of words in multiple, sentence, multiple languages. They convert cx to this shared latent space. And then they use the decoder to take the z from here to x hat. And they try to reduce the difference between x and x hat. They do this for both language L1 and L2. Then, in the other mode, they take a noisy sentence CY in the target language Y, they put it in the Z target space, and they use the decoder to construct it to x hat, and then try to, so this CY was generated by using their initial machine translation model. From x, you get the translation, from y to the translation of y, then you bring it back to x hat and then try to minimize the difference between these things. So they have this denoising auto encoding, they have this cross domain training, and the adversarial training module tries to make sure that the shared latent space, you cannot distinguish between representation of sentence in language L1 and language L2. And they combine these objectives into their final loss function. So, yeah, this is the basic uh, system. And again, these are the results. They showed how their system is working with more number of iterations, and that it is able to, as you use the different, um, uh, you show the Bloy in how it uh, compares with, this is supervised machine translation, and this is the unsupervised machine translation. They show that the quality that they achieve is similar to using 100,000 parallel sentences in, pre, in un, unsupervised mode. And then this is another work, uh, you know, just very new work, in the best paper in MNLP 2018 by Lampley et al., where they use a combination of these two models 
along with some small innovations, not really innovations, small things like using phrase representation, you know, cleaning up the neural network. And based on that, they are able to get uh, very good scores beating the supervised uh, neural machine translation standard methods. So with this, I conclude this task. So as we have seen that unsupervised uh, language processing there has and semi-supervised language processing, transfer learning, there has been a lot of progress and this holds a great promise for doing NLP and low resource languages. We also seen that systems may be greatly improved if you have limited supervised data. There's great promise in working on various tasks. Then multilingual systems that work for multiple languages and these underlying principles can be on the order. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, I would like to know about uh, zero learning. Is it? Bias, uh, that zero shot uh, learning which you were talking about, is it biased or it, uh, it is unbiased? So this is a very empirical finding. So the basic idea they wanted to show is that the space where they are putting the sentences are independent of language. So in the GNMT system that I showed, so they have encoders in multiple languages. Right, basically, actually, they have a shared encoder. They have one bit input to say which language you want the target in. So they put in the sentence, they get into some space, which is sort of an you know, language independent representation. And from this, they can take the target language, you know, they generate based on the input of the language, they generate this thing. So it is very difficult because there's not so much of theoretical uh, basis of this but a lot of empirical work, so it's very difficult to say if it's biased. And uh, secondly, I would like to ask about, uh, like you showed like unsupervised learning if it's converted with semi-supervised, so it can give better results than supervised. So in your opinion, what would be uh, the scope in the future? What, what would be more uh, performance giving? Like, No, you see, in general, in machine learning, unsupervised is more of a, you know, theoretical interest because unsupervised systems typically do not perform very well. However, in most cases, you know, whether you use neural network or not, having any, you know, if you, in many cases we have seen, if you put some effort to develop uh, labeled data, it helps a lot. However, these methods are very good. And if you can supplement them with supervised data, they can definitely have greater improvement. You know, till now, I think supervised learning is very good, but these unsupervised methods combined with, but basically in supervised learning require a lot of data. So these results are showing that with even small amount of data, you are able to do well because you are leveraging data of other languages. It is not that you are doing it completely without data or with very little data. because. You are either using data of other languages, like in the multilingual machine translation system, or in the unsupervised case, you are leveraging monolingual data. You are leveraging structure from large collection of monolingual corpus. That gives you the structure, and you typically do it in two steps. First step, you do multilingual word embedding. Again, using unsupervised or supervised methods, their unsupervised methods work really well. But so you get uh, this multilingual word embedding. And the second stage, you use this multilingual word embedding. And you find the structure of the sentences. And using leveraging that, you are trying to get this. So it is, you can look at this as task transfer. This is transfer from the basic language modeling task to machine translation task. You do not have data about machine translation, but you have monolingual data for language modeling. So it is more like task transfer, but they are really working surprisingly well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, I just have a general question. Um, so say we have constructed, uh, we have constructed a way to translate uh, the one phrase from from one sentence from English to say Hindi, Japanese, whatever, 
and we identify the correct information, we need to translate the correct sentiment that needs to be translated. And we have found the correct words in the uh, say Hindi, which have to be taken out and then formed in the sentence. So just generally, uh, then after this information has been extra extracted, does these uh, uh, procedures, do they give the final answer with the gram gr correct grammatical outputs or is that a second function? Right, which you know the Blois score, the final output is uh, yeah. evaluated on Blois score. Actually, if you look at the papers, they have some examples of actual translations. The objective definitely is to have a sentence which is grammatically correct, semantically correct, gives yes. the correct uh, meaning. So the is Blois that... The Blois score is only based on, you know, I seeing that some engrams are carried over. So yes, the objective is to get syntactically and semantically correct sentences. So, so far it's just inform factually correct and no, after no, not that... not necessarily. There are two levels. The first level you get a joint embedding word space where you get the words. But finally through this encoder decoder, whether you are using an LSTM or whatever, encoder decoder you are capturing the meaning of the sentence. The interlingua is a representation, you know, sort of representation of the entire semantics of the sentence. It's not just the words, individual words. So the objective is to get faithful translations fluent in the language. Okay, thank you. And that is the dream, of course. You can look at, you know, for example, Google translation system for several languages, at least for not very long sentences, it gives very good result. There's a lot of improvement in the last two years. But, you know, still more has to be done. It's still you know, some languages maybe for some domains or some uh, smaller domains it may have almost human level quality but still for general domain it may not work well but the objective is to get completely correct uh, yeah. so uh, i i found that uh, i mean uh, this last few slides is a great promise for indian language nlp right because that unsupervised what, uh, where we too. are stuck at basically we don't have uh, i mean many huge data but here also do you think that uh, volume of data could be an issue so what do you know i have no i do not as i said that machine translation is not something i have initially i tried but i found that it requires too much of gpu and too much of time which right. we could not have mm -hmm. but these results seem to show that with even you know 10,000, 100,000 parallel sentences and using this phrase based even without any parallel sentences, this doing very well. It looks very promising. Uh, they have illustrated it with examples of some languages. I hope that these systems... But language families could play some role, right? Because say you are learning the interlingua structure even using 10k sentences. But in, in Indian scenario, no, no we have 50k sentences. It definitely plays a role, but um, you know, it has to be seen. If you look at, for example, if you look at in Google Translate English to Hindi, you know, a few years ago it was very bad. Now it has improved uh, drastically. Yeah, yeah. English Bengali is still very bad, I mean, mm. but improving. So definitely, you know, there has been a lot of progress and uh, I think there's a lot of positive things to look for. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Okay. So the reason I was slightly wondering was because uh, if I take a graph, uh, I can write a semi-definite program and get a, a vector embedding for uh, orthonormal embedding for the graphs. Like if two vertices are non-adjacent, then they are ortho orthogonal to each other. Uh, if they are uh, adjacent, then they are their dot product is less than some epsilon. You can write a semi-definite solvent. Then if I have two graphs and I can do them, then I can just I graph isomorphism. But this is a very such simple I, structure. I just, they have these linear relations. So, I don't know. Okay, anyway, that's a side question. We can... Yeah, I think graph is a much more complex, more complex structure, system. whereas these structures are very simple. So, they have only one dimensional vector. The other question I had was, so in that unsupervised learning, you started with X, then you added, they did some noising in the first version. Yeah, so both, both versions add some noise. noise. What is the purpose of adding the noise? Why? So basically you want, because you don't have uh, parallel data, you want to have a translator from X hat to X. So right. it is like you uh, add noise, make from X to CX, and then you want to retrieve X. But what if you didn't add noise? You just X and then you... No, no, then you could have a trivial mapping. This is to prevent a trivial mapping. If you just take X to X, then it will not learn anything. It will just do copy from X to X. The neural network... But you're taking it into the other language space and bringing it back, right? Won't that... No, no, that is the second part. There are two parts. One is, uh, you know, so the first they have, they have this and then this. Right. So this part is the initial part. 
Right. So be before they can do this, they want us in initial uh, translation model. So use this to learn M0. I see. Right. To learn M0, they take X, add some noise, make it CX, then take it to this um, latent space, and then use the decoder to bring it back to X hat. So by this, they learn the decoder of L1 and decoder of L2 and the shared encoder. After they have learned the initial model M0, this M0 model is applied here. So how they get CY? They get CY by taking Y and, uh, sorry, taking X and then uh, using this M0 to generate the translation. I see. So they need this in order to develop the initial encoder decoder. And now here they use this model to do the, um, from, a, uh, from Y to CY, they do the translation to get the noisy Y. Right. Then they use the encoder decoder and then they, it, they refine this model. But they require this to get the initial model. Because this reminds me of, uh, uh, you know, several, maybe a decade ago, several years ago, people would play this game where they'd go to Google Translate, they'd put in a sentence like, uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Right, right. Then move it to a language, bring it back. Mm -hmm. Move it to another language, bring it back. And within like three iterations, it would be like totally uh, like a joke or something. And there's this meme going around. Uh, so, so, so those so you, models were not based on these types of uh, neural interlingual representation. They were based on the IBM model, I see. Which, which is very different. That's so right. in this model, because they were trying to constrain it to a space, there, you know, to abuse words, you know, you're trying to get it to a manifold where these things make sense. You're trying to prevent that from happening. I see. So that model, that class of models based on the me. IBM model was very different. Where these sort of changes... With these to, models, you won't have those... In fact, with iterations, it improves. These models improve with iteration. Okay. I mean, that is my feeling. Seems like a data augmentation scheme just to make the learning more robust. So you get the pseudo parallel sentences. Basically, since you don't have parallel sentences, you use this initial model to get the pseudo parallel sentences on which this one is uh, great. The, the operation of uh, decoding a turbo code in uh, you know uh, communications where you have basically these two coders which by or decoders uh, each by itself is quite weak mm -hmm. but uh, you know you get one of them to pass its output to the other and then back again and back again yes and you can show that we with, with each cycle actually the it improves uh, information you know is is increased I think, and yeah. so, you know, it seems like something similar might be happening. I, I think so, because, you know, this shows, yeah. this is the zeroth model with only the, you know, only one language, uh, these things. And using that model, you have M0, you apply it, get M1, then M2 and M3, and then you see that these things are improving. Yeah. It's not degrading, it is improving, and it's not that it will degrade. And so, most likely an information theoretic approach, my, uh, I mean, Analysis can probably be done right. quite similar. To you know, that. should be done. This is very recent work, and this is completely empirical work. Not much theory is there. Uh, any more questions? So uh, is this right to interpret that almost all these works, they are trying to learn some sort of vector representation? Some sort of? Vector representation for various Yes, things. they have this, in all the work, they have this uh, intermediate space which represents sentences. And underlying intuition for training those representation is co-occurrence in some way? Uh, you know, co-occurrence of what? Uh, not really co-occurrence, they are trying to find out is sentences, actual the sentence structure. So they have actual sentences in each of these languages. They are trying to represent vectors representing realistic sentence, real, real sentence structures, even real sentence meanings and their manifestations. I'm not sure what you mean by co-occurrence here. Maybe I can take it later. In the interest of time, let's, uh, yeah, thank the speaker once more.